Assalamu alaikum everyone. With me today we have Sister Jennifer Ogunyomi, who is the CEO and founder of Sisters in Business. And we're going to talk about all sorts of interesting things with you today, Jennifer. But one thing that caught my eye, which I don't think many of you will know, is that for a period of your time, of your life, you were homeless, yes. right? Yeah. Tell me, tell me a bit more about that because that's like, you know, Alhamdulillah, seeing you today here, mm-hmm. um, successful in your, you know, uh, in your business life, but also mm-hmm. mother of four, you no, you wouldn't think that. Yeah, absolutely. So it was 16 years old and I got kicked out of the house. Um, I had nowhere to go. Um, no relatives that would take me in, no friends, mums or anything that could take me in. So I ended up being homeless. And in London? Or? In London, East London to be more specific. Um, I was homeless um, for a year. So before, you know, the council was able to step in and help. Um, I was sofa surfing. I was university dorm surfing. Um, until I get caught and then get kicked out all over again. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty tough time at wow. that time. So when university um, surf, dorm surfing, how does yeah, that work? So just staying with friends who were who had dorms ah, in universities and until I get caught, you get kicked out all over again. I think the furthest that I went was Hertfordshire University. That's how desperate I had become. Um, and I was there for, I think, two nights. Wow. And then she got in trouble, so I had to go. So, yeah, it was a pretty tough time. It was a really, really tough time. Um, but, you know, within that time, I found so much. I found Islam. Um, I found myself, well, the beginning of myself anyway. Um, so, yeah, it, it was traumatic because I'm a woman, first of all. I was a really young girl. It was traumatic because I was asked, begging to go back home to my mum and she, nope, you're not coming back home. Really? Yeah, it was really like, you're not coming back home don't want you no more um but then can I just say that it was also a sense of relief of being out because I went through a lot of childhood bullying as well at right. home um being the oldest being the darkest being the biggest I just went through a lot of childhood bullying yeah. um and so as much as it was traumatic it was also a sense of relief that I was able to get out of that and to start to find myself but it was difficult you know in London no dependents no children no mental health issues. I, I wasn't presenting to be part of the LGBTQ um, community. So there was no help wow. whatsoever. And uh, were you in school or like studying or working? Like what were you doing in like during the day? So during the day, I was in first year of college. Right. So during the day, i will be at college. But then, you know, when you're going around people, you try to put on this facade that everything is okay but people started to notice because I was wearing the same clothes over and over again or I wasn't looking as presentable as I did you know in the first couple of months of starting college so that was really difficult because I'm coming to college I'm trying to smile I'm trying to learn but then I've got all these things that I'm battling which then not on effect my learning so first year of college was really I'm telling you it was a haze it was a blur because there was just so much going on um but yeah so during the day I would be at college and then in the evening I would bus surf so I'll take the buses up and down just to kill time um I hardly was eating because I had no money no benefits um people that was helping me was only helping me with a couple of pounds here and there um and even at college there was times where teachers had bought me lunch because they knew that you know I was really struggling um but yeah it was it was it was a tough time it was and, and how long did that last and you know what did what what did it teach you do you think it lasted a whole year um 17 i turned 17 and then i was offered a hostel and the hostel I was offered was a hostel of teenage pregnancy it was a hostel of mental health issues and my neighbors both next to me and above me alcohol dependent and schizophrenic oh my god so i was completely always scared coming in through the front door, trying to get into my hostel really quickly. Oh, no. You know, I didn't want to confront anybody. <laughs> and then, you know, that hostel at that time, it was known that that was a hostel. So when you're coming out of there and going in there, people know why you're there. Yeah. Although they, I wasn't pregnant, I wasn't, but just people just knew that a hostel wasn't a place of being great. Yeah, and yeah. so that was really difficult. And that was really, really hard. You know, I'm born and raised in Chinkford. I've come from an... an an affluent area yeah. um, you know I went to a really good secondary school yeah. and then to be seen coming in and out of somewhere that isn't what I'm used to 
was really hard. Um, so I think that that experience in itself was difficult. But then what added the added what was the added pressure was I was only given five pounds a week Tesco vouchers. Wow, not cash. So what, how did you survive then? Tesco vouchers every single week buying tuna noodles, cordial juice, like multi bag packs of crisps crackers, biscuits, so I can survive for the week. And it wasn't like I could get branded stuff because five pounds doesn't go very far. And you're still at A-levels and yes, college? Yes, second year of college by this point. Wow. And so the local um, authority used to pay for my bus ticket right. every week. And I had to go there and sit down and queue up and they, they give you your bus ticket and then they present you your five pound vouchers. Um, so yeah, that's how I was able to get up and down free of charge on public transport, but that was only on buses. I couldn't do trains or anything. So by this time I had moved my college to somewhere a bit further. So I was traveling for at least maybe an hour and a half from where I was to go to college. Um, but yeah, so that was, again, even though I was much more comfortable than sleeping on the street and people's yeah. dorms and stuff, it was still difficult because I still wasn't eating very well. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, um, how has your relationship, has, has your relationship changed with your family, your mother over time from then to now? So I'm still estranged from my parents. Um, it did get better um, and then it strained um, and then it got better and it strained. And now I think we're five years not speaking. Right, right. And do you think, uh, where did Islam come into all of this? Islam came in on my bus rides um, when I was homeless. So I was doing a bus ride one particular day and I saw two sisters sitting on the bus. To be honest with you, I didn't really pay particular attention to hijab or anything like that. I, I just didn't pay any attention. She was reading a book and I said to her, what book are you reading? And you were from like a what, Christian kind of background? Yes, so African okay. Christian, I would say, right, which right. is very different to like the Church of England type of Christianity. Um, and I just said to her, I said, you know, what book are you reading? She gave me the book. She gave me her number. Anything you need, let me know. Um, I took the book home and I read this book every single day, multiple times a day. And I kept finding things in it that I was resonating with, you know, just being disciplined or grounded. Just what was giving it, that, it was just a book about Islam. Oh, it right. wasn't a, a biography. It wasn't anything. It was right. literally the five pillars of Islam. Wow. And that's all it was. Um, tried to contact her. Couldn't reach her. Her number. I don't know what happened, but her phone was unreachable. Um, read that book every day and I read the book to the point where the pages started to stick together. Wow. And that was from tears of when I was reading it. That was when I was eating and reading or drinking and reading. And, but there was something in that book that just kept drawing me back to that book. Um, now by this point I had met my, my husband, which is, which was my partner then and not knowing that he was Muslim. So I hid the book from him. Oh, right. Cause I thought, well, you know, I don't want no one to know that I'm reading this book. And you didn't know he was a Muslim? And I didn't know he was a Muslim. What's his name? Abdurrahman. Oh, so right. he's actually a born Muslim. Right. <laughs> but um, he but was using know. his African name. Oh, was he? Okay. So yeah, so it, you know, where we're from in Africa, we have two names. Either Christian right. or Muslim name and you have an African name. I see. Um, and I did know him by Ramon, but yeah. that could mean anything. Could I just anything, didn't yeah. think. Yeah. And then one day I brought the book out and he goes, oh, why didn't you just ask me I'm Muslim? Yeah. And I was just shocked. I completely was shocked. I was like, how would I know that you was Muslim? Yeah. Um, anyway, um, it was August and I said, okay, take me to the mosque. I want to learn about, you know, I, I've been learning. Now I think I'm ready for that step. So it took me to the, um, to the mosque, which happened to be one of the largest um, Nigerian mosques in the UK. And as soon as I entered the mosque, I just saw a sea of black sisters and black brothers that were speaking my language that looked like me. Mm. And I thought, okay, I, I think I'm in the right place. Mm. Um, took my shahada. And on went, the first day? On that day. Wow. Took my shahada, I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. Took my shahada, went to the back of the mosque and I was sitting down. Everyone's coming up to you, congratulations. And so how did they do the shahada? Did they do it in the front of the, like, the they imam? done it in front of everyone. The imam, the imam, imam done it, oh, it in wow. front of everyone. Now, Bearing in mind that this day there was an Akika going on. Oh, wow. Okay. So they stopped the Akika. They brought me up to the front and they were talking to me. And I'm looking into the sea of all these oh, people that I don't know. Um, and they were asking you the normal questions. Were you forced? Were you coerced? Is this your choice? Are you sure you want to do this? You know? And I was just like, yes, I'm okay. I want to do it. I want to do it. 
done it. And where's Abdul Rahman here? Right? Yeah, he's in the back. He's, he's in hanging the back. Around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he knows <laughs> the people in the mosque yeah. because obviously that's his mosque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so he was just hanging around. Um, he's like, this is brilliant. Yeah, he was just looking. It's a, it's he couldn't believe it. It's a difficult conversation with my parents. He's resolved now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, I think for him, he just couldn't believe that I was willing to change from what I was yeah. into something new. And yeah. I think that was just, you know, he's born Muslim. Mm. He's around Muslims all the time, whether they're practicing or not. He was always around Muslims. Yeah. So to meet someone that wanted to change their faith from one thing to the other for him, he was in disbelief. He mm. was like, are you sure? Are you ready? Um, so sitting in the back of the mosque, people are congratulating me and I see a figure walk past me. And it was the two sisters that gave me the book on the bus. Oh, wow. And they actually knew my husband and grew up with him in the mosque. Oh, wow. And that's when I was like, I'm home. There was no way that anyone could have written that where I got the interest from Islam from and that sadaqa that she gave me from giving me that book mm. that led me to the mosque was then now the person that grew up with my husband and um, they're family friends of mine now. Like, it's, wow. they were joined at the hip, in fact. Wow. Yeah, and you're you're still you're you know you're still in touch. You know? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Still in touch. Um, went to their wedding, see their Amazing. first children born. It's just been an experience that. Okay. okay. An experience that I know it's really weird the way that my story happened. That's brilliant. Yeah, but it's just the way that Allah wrote it. Honestly, I I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's going fantastically. I think, yeah. I think you're 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 a great speaker, right? So that alhamdulillah helps. Yeah, alhamdulillah, so definitely. That's that. That's a crazy story. It is. It is. We, um, we don't, you know, most of us don't realize how lucky we are. And I imagine your kids, right? They probably have never been through this, right? So, yeah. you know, we we just don't realize. Most people don't realize what what they have. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's also a level of, maybe it also maybe even if you do realise what you have, I think there's a level of, you know, there's a certain struggle that we all go through and all our struggles are completely different. Mm. But within those struggles, for me, there's always a lesson of not looking at the end, but looking at the crumbs that I left behind. Mm. And seeing that those were the, those are the actual lessons. So the yeah. homelessness was the lesson. The living on five pounds a week was the lesson. You know, all of that built up to having something that I have now, mashallah. Yeah, I mean, with your, I mean, I'm sure you've tried, right, with your parents. Yeah, of yeah. course. I'm 36. I have four children. I've grown, and if they're not willing to want to be a part of that, I can't force that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I have to also understand that there's a level of me respecting their decisions in not wanting to be a part of my life. Yeah. But then also um, explaining to my children yeah. that they have grandparents that don't yeah. want to be a part of their life as well. Tough, isn't it? Yeah. And it, what, do you, what do you think it is? Like, are, are, they, are, they just, are they part of your other brothers and sisters' lives or...? Or they just they're there, that's the way they are. Um, there is so yeah. So mum, my mum is actually not part of any of her of her children's lives. Oh, any no. of them. So you know there is a part of maybe that's just how it is yeah. and that's how it is. But you know it hurts because it started with me, yeah. and it then ended with me. And the thing is, even though she doesn't talk to my other siblings, the hatred for me is still very strong, mm. and I actually don't understand where that. Mm. where that was born from or where it's come from yeah. um, but it just makes it difficult because I have children who see their grandparents on the other side and don't see on this side and they're like well who's your mum and you know what does she look like the only mm. one that will remember my mum is my oldest child but the others don't have any yeah. recollection of her yeah. whatsoever I can't actually remember you, you, so you, uh, you back to your conversion story yeah. let's go back, back there um, so you've given your shahada yeah. uh, you, you feel at home um, now, Rahman is now Abdurrahman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he sounds like a character, Abdurrahman. Yeah, no, he is. <laughs> he is. He is. Um, I think the thing, that, the thing that I really appreciate about my husband is 
the appreciation of leaving another life behind. He mm. appreciates that so much. Mm. And even when we talk about my, you know, he even says to me that I actually forget that you've never been Muslim before. I actually forget that you married into a completely new community and you've taken them on and they've taken you on like you've known each other for years and years and years. And I and I appreciate that appreciation because it's so easy as a revert to be forgotten that yeah. you are a revert. Yeah. And that when you're presented with tests or you're presented with situations where you cannot control, i.e. family and celebrations, people are very, very quick to judge. Mm-hmm. And people are very, very quick to lend their nasiha or their advice without understanding that actually my beginnings was never Islam in the first mm-hmm. place. So him having that appreciation then made it easy for me to be able to navigate certain things and certain yeah. tests without having the pressure of, you need to be like this. This is haram. This yeah. is halal. Yeah. You know, he was a little bit more relaxed in doing that, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, and, and so you, um, you know, we, we were talking off camera, we've got, mashallah, four kids. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear your... Um, and we'll turn to the entrepreneurship and sisters and business as well a little bit later. Mm. But I wanted to hear, you know, what the experience was like for for you, but also for your kids growing up, um, you know, black in London yeah. or from an African background in London, uh, Muslim background, mm-hmm. right, in London. All mm-hmm. of those kind of add layers upon layers yeah. um, of, I guess, complexity. Yes. You know, it's difficult. It's difficult because... Look at the times that we're living in, okay? There's a lot of anti-blackness, whether it's the Muslim community or outside the Muslim community, there's a lot of anti-blackness. And I always um, put things into perspective. And the one example that that I give to people when I say putting things into perspective is when you send your child to the shops, you know that you're privileged when you do not need to ask your child to get a receipt for the thing that they bought. Mm. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know you're privileged because you know that your child would not be stopped. And even if they were stopped, they would be believed. Mm. I am raising four black children, two of them being black boys. My eldest is a six foot two big lad. And that line of my children looking cute to being a threat is very, very thin. Mm. And so it's difficult because not only are you trying to instill their identity into them, their Muslim identity, their African identity, but also their British identity without it being stripped away from by society and what people think you should be versus what you actually are. It's difficult because then now I'm presented with things like gangs and knives and drugs and, you know, all the things that my parents probably didn't have to worry so much about growing Mm. up. I'm now with that pressure of worrying about things like that. And so my first child was very much sheltered for the first seven years. We homeschooled him, didn't have a TV in the house. You know, we were very, very strict on the way that we wanted to bring him up. He's my first child. I was a revert. I wanted the best, Um, which also meant that he wasn't very street smart. Right. Which meant that when we then sent him to school, it was he was very impressionable mm. because he didn't understand that not everybody is from your safe space. Yeah. And so when you don't have that safe space, your child is li- literally just left in the wild. And so, you know, we've had experiences within bringing up, especially my first child, we've had experiences where I've had to put him completely out of school homeschool him all over again buy a ticket to take him to Africa because you're not staying in this country yeah I like that <laughs> yeah 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 like I have you know and the thing is is that at that point I'm not born and raised in Africa at all I'm born and yeah. raised here my mum's half English and half Nigerian right so um, but you've got family in Nigeria I only have a, a sister an right. older sister from a different dad oh right right um, that's in Nigeria but all of my family are actually German and Jamaican oh really yeah they're actually German and Jamaican. So we, my, my siblings and me and another set of our cousins, we're the only blacks. The rest of my family present as white. Oh, really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So uh, like the big family get, get together must be like... Yeah, yeah really it's crazy. crazy. You hear Irish, you hear German, <laughs> you hear Jamaican accents. It's <laughs> like, it's all, we're one big melting pot. Yeah. Um, and so when you've got that and then you're bringing up children that is being tested with different things, And not only are they being tested with different things, you're also being tested because actually I'm not from the typical Muslim background. So exactly what do I do? Because, you know, if you have a white revert, this 
frankly stick out like a sore thumb, right? Yeah. In in a typical masjid, mm-hmm. but you don't, right? Exactly. So people, you know, don't necessarily give you that leeway. Exactly. And I remember the school before we pulled him out. He, the head teacher said to me, he said, "Mum, you're the only black Muslim mum that we call up to the school as much as we do." And that for me spoke heaps into how we are perceived as black Muslims in the community. What did they mean by that? My child is a problem mm. at that point. He was a problem. Yeah. I knew he was a problem, but I'm the only mum who's coming out to the school to confront the problem. I see. And on top of that, I'm not only that mum in a very heavily dominated Asian area, I'm also hijabi, which also mm. makes me stand out even more. Yeah. And then the majority of the teachers are middle-class white men and white women who already have their own perceptions of what Muslims are, but yet what black kids are in the area. Mm. So I'm navigating two, um, two assumptions of what people think that we are. And then I've got a child who is displaying those statistics. <laughs> you know, how do you navigate that Islamically, but also being African, navigating yeah. that? So the African in me was like, I'm buying you a ticket, you're going back to Africa. Yeah. Although he's never it's been, tough. but it's I had so much faith in my country. That's where he's going to go. Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. What, um, what I was going to ask was, you know, about the racism within the Muslim community, um, because it's there. I'll be ready 100%. for that conversation. <laughs> I think so. Um, like, I mean, I'll be, you know, transparent. Like, my granddad, uh, he, you know, he was very elderly. Fine, you can give a bit of leeway because yeah. of that. And he's grown up in, you know, in India and then Pakistan. Um, and he used to, like, when I went to America for the first time, he, you know, and, and he heard that I was in Harlem. I think I was, like, staying in Harlem for a while. Um, and... Uh, he used to call up every night. He used to like not go to sleep every night mm-hmm. because he like seen you know videos or films mm-hmm. or news stories about mm-hmm. how the black people in Harlem are like really you know violent and it's like all kind of and so he was really concerned about that for me. Yeah. But also it comes you know fundamentally if you think about it, it is like a racist position to hold, mm-hmm. right? And and I think that the you know the Muslim community is is very racist. Not just against like black, but against, you know, against each other as well in all sorts of, but I wanted to hear your experience, you know, in this space as well. So I guess our experience is that, you know, my husband will go to the mosque to pray his salah and he'll get dragged from one end of the mosque to the other end of the mosque physically for being a black boy in a mosque. Um, our experience Why? is but just because he's what? a black. Wow. Recently or? Yeah, in that area. Not recently, but with, this was maybe just even past five years, six, seven years, maybe. Wow. Um, and that's a dangerous thing to do with your husband because he's like... He's my husband's a, a semi-pro, <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's a professional Muay Thai fighter. So, yeah. mashallah, you know, his patience, actually. Allah granted, yeah. he granted him so much patience. Yeah. I could never be dragged from one side to the mosque and yeah. not feel like I had to retaliate. Yeah. Um, but mashallah, Allah gave him so much patience because... He just came home and he told me that this is what happened. And I was completely shocked. Not that shocked that, you know, we hear people say black this, black that, whatever. That you can, but to be physically removed is mm. what is another level of hatred or dislike or whatever that is, that whether that came from for that yeah. person. Um, racism looks like when I first reverted and I signed onto an Alima course and being told very bluntly by the Pakistani sister that I do not belong there because I'm a wow. black sister. Um, racism looks like, um, you know, sending my child to an Islamic school and him being physically attacked for being the only black boy in his class. Wow. That's racism. Um, how do you navigate all of that? Only by the mercy of Allah mm. without reverting back to what I was before I became Muslim number one. So that was a big test on my character. Mm. But also made me understand that you know, um, there's a lot, a lot of anti-blackness in the Muslim community. Mm. Like you said, I can forgive the elders because the elders are the elders. And even in our country, the elders hold some sort of racist views yeah. on certain communities. We yeah. will never, everyone can admit that. Yeah. But if you're a young person and you have these views, I can't excuse that. Yeah. I can't. And then if I now fast forward to be it being an entrepreneurship, People like to call it microaggressions, but actually it's aggression. 
Mm. Um, it's aggression that people will sit in front of you and um, belittle what you've built. Or they'll sit in front of you and tell you no, that they can't be a part of what you do, but then they will go and be a part of someone else who's done doing something similar, who presents either as an Asian person or as a white person. Now, the thing for me is, is that I always, always have to maintain some sort of integrity. Mm. I always, always have to remain dignified in every single situation, not only as a black person, but also as a Muslim sister. Yeah. It's difficult every single day to turn up to somewhere to police what I say, police how I behave, but then also police the fact that you may hold a certain view about me because I'm a black Muslim. Mm. And that makes the business world very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, just to be completely honest with you, the landscape of businesses in the UK is dominantly held by the South Asian community. Yeah. And being in the community of the Muslim community, we're dealing a lot with, and it's not to say that every person has mm. been like that, but you do, you will recognize some sort of microaggressions or assumptions that people yeah. hold of you. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I was, I was listening recently to um, the story of Bilal, radiallahu anhu, um, and, you know, even, even at the time of the Sahaba, there was racism, right? Um, but, um, but I guess, you know, the, the teachings of the, our Prophet وسلم, around that is what, you know, we should, I guess, tell people to, to adhere to. Yeah, um, I smile because respectfully, everyone goes to Bilal. Hmm. Bilal is not the only black in Islam back then. Hmm. People forget that in the in the Sira of the Prophet, the first country that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to was Abyssinia, which is, known, sure, as yeah. Ethi- which is yeah. known as Ethiopia now. Yeah. And the black king and the black people of that land after the Arabs were the next set of Muslims mm. that took Shahada. Yeah, yeah. Right, but yet we still go back to Bilal because mm. that's all that we've been taught yeah. in this particular society that that's the black person that we go mm. to. Now, I love Bilal and I love what Bilal stood for but when you go deeper into it actually Bilal was a slave and Bilal was a poor man and that's that's why I have an issue with people going back to Bilal Mm. not because of what he done and what he you know what he stood for but because Mm. of his beginnings and again it's still holding that rhetoric of black people being less than Mm. but not looking at the fact that the Prophet and Islam freed him from being less than and elevated his position to be better but he's not the only one in the seer of the Prophet that are black yeah or even minorities right so I think there was like a group of the three Sahaba um, Bilal and then uh, Suhaib al-Rumi who is the other outsider, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I forget the third one, Uh, Salman al-Farsi. So the three of them used to, I think, hang around quite a lot together. Mm -hmm. And they, I think there was an incident where um, at the time of the conquest of Mecca, they were quite harsh about, or they they were quite, you know, um, dismissive of Abu Sufyan, who's like the leader of the Mm -hmm. Quraysh at the time. And, uh, and Abu Bakr al who he rebuked them and he said, you know, basically like, you know, he's, he's still a leader and you should respect him for that. Um, and then Prophet Sallam, he, he sided with these guys. Mm. He was like, sure, you know, uh, you know, whoever, you know, whatever Abu Sufyan might be, but they have like a higher station. Um, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, Prophet Sallam could have, you know, this is Abu Bakr we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I feel like we, as a Muslim community, we should be a lot more um, inclusive to particularly minority voices. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, you know, I think as, as what the West would call all of us as minorities, yeah. my, my thing is now is that how are we coming together as minorities? We're all children of migrants, mm. whether you're brown, whether you're black, we're all children of migrants. And what our parents have sacrificed to come And to give us better education, you know, money, wealth, jobs, and all of that. That's what should really be uniting us and making, wanting to make, you know, society a lot better. But then I also understand that, you know, there are, of course, racist views or, you know, presumptuous views or prejudices that do exist. And I think it's, it's, it's for us to educate through the lens of Islam that this is not what it is, you know. And so, yeah, it's... 
it's difficult, but at the same time, you know, I decided to become Muslim. And the day that I took my shahada was also the day that I promised myself and promised Allah that I would never ever see anyone as separate. I see everyone as the same. You know, so as much as we go through racist things, some of the first sisters that took me in when I took my shahada was a Pakistani family, mm. was a Bengali family, was a Somali family. So actually, my love mm. for, you know, everybody is genuine and it's real. I want to yeah. see everybody succeed, right? Yeah. But then it's really hard also to turn up to places and be on the defense. Because mm. that's not what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about uh, entrepreneurship. Mm. So... Um, you know, you, you run Sisters in Business and uh, how did that start? Oh gosh, Sisters in Business started um, five years ago, six months pregnant, working in NHS. I was, um, I was just in a job I didn't want to do anymore. My whole career is in NHS, right? So midwifery to consultancy to project management. And I had enough. So at six months pregnant, I decided that that was it. With my last child, it's the last child, and this is me getting out. Um, I decided to launch a business that was catered to women of color. So it was a beauty box, um, a subscription beauty box. And it just failed. I was left with stock in my house. <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do? Why did it fail? Do you know what? I think it failed because I didn't, I had the idea, but I didn't have the passion. I didn't truly believe in it, if, I'd be, if I'm going to be really honest. Yeah. I truly didn't believe in that product. I truly didn't believe in the model. But it was easy for me to do because I'm a woman of colour and I can always speak to other women of colour. Sure. And, and, and uh, like practically, where do you think like, you know, things fell down? Like, you know, was it just... Marketing. Yeah. Understanding marketing, understanding sales, understanding that when you launch a product, you still can't be behind the computer. You've got to go from behind the computer out into the world. Yeah. You know, that's where it all fell practically. Yeah. Which you do quite well, right? Naturally. Yeah. Oh. Um, but for some reason, it just wasn't, it wasn't working. It didn't click. No. And so I was left with over 5,000 products in my house. And no money left in the bank because I plunged everything, including my savings oh my into God. that into packaging, branding, all of it. And it failed. And I was completely devastated because that meant that I couldn't leave the job. Mm. It meant that my husband had to hold a lot more than what he would have um, held in financially because I had to get back out of it. Um, and I remember crying on the third day. My husband said, you know what? You can't keep crying. What are you going to do? Where are we going from where you are now? How are we moving forward? So, so Beauty Box was where did you buy this from? You put it all together yourself? Huh? Yes. So it'd be all put together by us. It would be on a website and it would be subscription. So people would subscribe and we would know that we were, where we're sending the boxes to. I see. Every month. And do you think that, like, did you do like the research beforehand or like do like, do you think in retrospect it, it might have been better to do like small tests beforehand to like figure out if there was a demand for it? 100%. And that's when I learned that my character trait is I go in Oh, I don't do nothing. So I go all in or yeah. I don't do nothing at all. Um, and so, yeah, I should have done testing. I should have done market research. I should have known exactly who my target audience was. I should have understood where to better place finances into different things. So maybe into, into the website and stuff like this. Mm. I didn't have that knowledge. I'm going to be honest. I didn't have that knowledge. I just knew I wanted to do a business. I wanted to get out of a situation and I wanted to make money. This was the first time you did that. That was the first time. Wow. And, and I think that pretty much everyone fails, right? Uh, yeah. Usually, at least, in the first, yeah. the first time they do something. Um, I mean, I know, I know I've failed many times. Um, but then, how did you land on your feet? I went back to the essence of what meant so much to me when I took my shahada, which was sisterhood. At that time, being pregnant, and at that time, not having any money, I needed my sisters. But I needed sisters that I didn't know. Because it's so much more easier to be vulnerable with people that you don't know rather than being people that you do know, right? Mm. And I needed people that I didn't know. I needed a refresh. I, I didn't need a whole new set of friends. So my friends don't start getting angry. I didn't need a whole new set of friends. <laughs> but what I did need was different conversations. Yeah. And those conversations was why did the business that I build not work? Mm. And then I decided to put on the very first event with Sisters in Business. And that failed because no one bought a ticket. Right, okay. So I pulled it back. Yeah. 
And instead of crying, I pulled it back and I worked on it. And I was like, okay, what is that? What is it that's not clicking? Yeah. What is it? What is it? The messaging? Is it the branding? What's that's not clicking? Yeah. And then I realized very, very quickly that I need to show the passion and the love that I have for sisterhood. I need to be able to show that through the messaging. And I've done it. And the very first event sold out within two weeks. And that was 40 spaces. Wow. And that sold out. And then the second one and the third and the 10th and the 11th. And that's when I said, this is a business. And what did the ticket sell at? £25 at the time. Right. So it's not a small commitment. No. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, and uh, and how, that's been running for five years now. Been running for five years. How many events have you done since? Gosh, over 50. Oh, wow. Gosh, All wow. around like London or have you been outside as well? No, we haven't been outside yet. But you're going to do it? Yes, definitely. You're going to venture out? 100%. Yeah. It's about time. And it's also about building capacity, isn't it? And yeah. building a team and making sure yeah, that I have yeah, capacity. Yeah. I'm a mum of four children. I'm also a wife. And my responsibilities are first and foremost in the home before anything else. So I have to make sure that that's all right. I can't go around traveling as much as I'd love to. I can't go around traveling if the home mm. is not okay. So we're at, now we're at the stage where, alhamdulillah, we've got the team. Um, and then now I'm able to branch out and do different things. How big is the team now? So the big the team is a team of four. Alhamdulillah. And they're, they're all based in London or? No. Or, or, so or, my ops manager is based in Pakistan. Right. Okay. Um, my social media manager is based in Morocco. Right. Okay. Our community and events coordinator is based here. Um, and our admin is also based in Malaysia, but soon to be also um, based here. Wow. So there's a real mix. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, um, you know, being an entrepreneur and and managing, you know, family life. Um, because I know that, you know, sometimes, and I'm sure many couples will feel this, it's almost like, you know, there's a bit of a tug of war, mm. right, that happens. Mm. How, how did you find, you know, juggling everything? Oh, gosh, if my husband was here, he'll tell you that. <laughs> it was a real power struggle. Yeah. And I think as an entrepreneur, as a woman entrepreneur, as a Muslim woman entrepreneur, when success comes, and I remember when we first, when we done our first 10K month, and I was like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm everything. You can't come and tell me nothing. <laughs> like, and that is difficult because not difficult in the sense that, you know, anyone can do what, you know, make 10K or whatever. But it was difficult because I had to constantly remind myself that even though we're making that sort of money, he is still my husband. Mm. So there's still respect. And I think one, what people don't realize is that I've been married for 20 years. Alhamdulillah, I've been married for a very long time. So our relationship has seen all sorts, right? But it was really tested when the business was building because it took so much of my time away. Yeah. It took so much of my energy away. It meant that I had to rely so much more on my husband to do more childcare and stuff like that mm. if I'm you know, doing other things. And that was difficult because then... We've gone from him being out of the home and working and doing all of that and me being in the home and taking care of everything to now being outside of the home and asking him if he could, you know, have the children on the weekend and, you know, do you mind doing the cooking this evening? And, you know, it, the dynamics do change. But within the change of the dynamics, for me, came a power struggle because I had to constantly remind myself that it doesn't matter how much money you're making. He's still the head of the house. He's still my husband. Mm. And I have to constantly give him that respect. So, yes, for the, within the five years, we've had years where it's been back and forth. You know, you're acting like you're to this and you're not doing this enough and you have expectations. And there's all sorts of things that go on. And mm. But then one thing that I really do appreciate about my husband is just being that support network, regardless yeah. of what stage I'm in. Amazing. And, um, but with, you know, uh, looking back, you know, is, is there a way to try and, you know, what would advice would you give to, let's say, uh, a young female entrepreneur who is possibly facing into something like this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how should then, how, like, what advice would you give to a younger self? So there was a comment that my husband made and he said to me he goes look I know that you're growing and I know that you're at a stage where you probably know much more than me but he said you have to wait for me as well and that would be my advice if you feel like your progression is becoming more than your husband mm. you have to wait for him and you have to pull him up to where you are mm. 
because it's not going to work if one feels like they're under and one feels like they're on top. And that's the thing about growth, whether it's personal growth, business growth, whatever it is, wherever I am, if my husband feels like he's not at that place, mm. I have to wait and I will stop mm. and I would just stagnate at that level until he's reached that level and vice versa. Yeah. And what would you say to husbands? Like, what should they do? Um, I mean, first of all, it's understanding understanding that the woman just wants to be able to be economically independent to bring something into her home. Mm. And also understanding that it doesn't take away from her being a wife or being a mum. In fact, entrepreneurship enhances those responsibilities. So it's understanding, it's being patient, but also supporting her in the way that she needs, whether it's emotional, psychological, psychologically, not necessarily business-wise, right? And that's something that I had to put a boundary between me, me and my husband. That I don't always need business advice. Like, leave me to it. Yeah. But support me in every other way. And that's what I would say to other brothers as well, inshallah. My, my wife, whenever, um, uh, whenever something goes well on, uh, in IFG, she always claims it. She's like, look, I told you. Yeah, because uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we whenever do. something goes wrong, she's like, look, I told you. Yep. So, um, and then she re- regularly asks me for shares. She's like, look, I've, I, like, I've given you so many. Yeah, like, my wait. husband's always asking me. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, there's something about, you know, and this is the thing, isn't it? Like, it's a bit like learning to drive with your husband or learning to drive with yeah. your partner. When you're in the car, I don't need you to be telling me how to do it, how to yeah, do it. Yeah. But what I do need is if I took the wrong turn, just be easy, yeah. you know, and I, allow me to take that wrong turn. Um, and so I remember that, you know, before my husband, so my husband is a PT and I remember for years before, before he became PT, I kept saying to him, be a PT. Yeah. He's a professional um, Muay Thai bo- um, boxer. He's won medals and belts and awards and everything. Yeah. Elevate that and go into it. Yeah. But it's also the same way that he pushed me to be better with sisters in business. Yeah. You know, always pushing me like, no, Jay, like Jennifer, you can do so much more. Mm. Don't sit at what it is that you're doing. Push yourself. You made 10K. How are we making 20K? Mm. How will we keep, how do we keep pushing the bar up yeah. and higher to ensure that we're always achieving and doing better? Yeah. So yeah, we all deserve shares in each other's businesses for that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and uh, Jennifer, what, what's the plan, you know, what's exciting you about the future? I think the first thing that's excited me about the future is, um, is our growth. Um, being able to have the capacity to grow the team and grow it even bigger, inshallah. But also taking Sisters in Business from what it was and developing it into a whole new membership and ensuring that we're constantly on the ball with the sisters. And so it means that we're entering the virtual world a little bit more. It means that we're, you know, we're doing things virtually for everyone to be able to be a part of it, but still keeping the essence of sisterhood. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, those are like our most exciting things. So Sisters in Business, uh, there's a website. Yes www.citizenbusiness.co.uk Brilliant. I, I suspect that's a good name to go for, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it, is. it um, is. And uh, and people can sign up for this membership. Yes. What, what is in the membership? Oh, there's all sorts. We have monthly coaching. We have chat and chai weekly sessions. Ah. There's e-books in there that we're not given to anyone else. And we have resources like a, a digital journal that I had just recently put yeah. together, social media templates to make it easy for the sisters. Yeah. But what I love most about Sisters in Business membership is we have expert lead coaches right. that is in there that will hold their sessions with you so that you can go from not understanding to understanding and not knowing how to make sales to make sales, but essentially to support you in your business and doing what you're doing. Amazing. Um, Jennifer, it's been... Uh, a pleasure and an honor having you on. Thank you. Um, and inshallah, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll do it again at some point. Yes, definitely. Uh, and we'll find out. I need to get, uh, after this, I need to have a chat and see if we can get uh, Ramon, aka Abdul Rahman. Yeah, you should. Because he sounds like a legend. Definitely. He'll, he'll love that. <laughs> <laughs> Jazakallah khair. All right. Asalaamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.